welcome to this video and in this video I wanted to go through one of the methods that can be used to detect exoplanets and it's called microlensing and there's a variety of different ways in which an exoplanet can be detected so this is a planet around another star that's not in the solar system and microlensing is a method that hasn't basically hasn't really produced a huge amount of exoplanets so far and the other methods are a bit more prolific so far so anyway, um, it all starts with gravitational lensing. So what is gravitational lensing? Well, the best example really is with galaxy clusters. So these are clusters of galaxies which are enormous objects in the universe. They have an enormous amount of mass in them. So they actually curve the space. And if there's a galaxy or an object behind that cluster, as the light passes around it, it actually takes a curved path. So it acts as a lens. So we would refer to that galaxy cluster as a gravitational lens because it can magnify and distort the image behind it. So a galaxy behind would end up being magnified in the same way that a normal lens might operate. So that is fairly easy to see. I say fairly easy. That's still a very long way off. But these are examples of galaxy clusters that have been imaged. And you can see those arcs in the images. Now those arcs are distorted galaxies behind the main cluster so they the light from them has been bent around it's been distorted and it's a very easy example to see because there's a lot of mass there you can see the distortion and these are fairly common in galaxy clusters but micro lensing is a, basically a smaller version of that it's on a much smaller scale and it's not as obvious so in this case here, instead of having a galaxy cluster acting as a lens, you've got a smaller object acting as a lens between us and some background star. So if we watch a background star, a gravitational lens will pass in front and the background star is magnified so it becomes brighter. Now if it's a single lens, so let's say it's a, a another star, it passes in front. As it passes in front, the light is bent around, it acts as a lens, it's magnified, it becomes brighter, and you get that plot at the bottom. So you get a nice symmetric change in brightness and magnification as that lens passes in front. Now, if you've got a lens star and an exoplanet orbiting that lens star, you get more of an asymmetric increase in brightness of the background star. So this time round, you get that background shape, so the, the, the background star is magnified and you get that overall increase in brightness. But then as the exoplanet goes in front as well, you get an additional spike in that, which relates to the exoplanet itself. And this is this can be true for an exoplanet or it could be a binary star system. It, it's basically a multiple lens is going to cause you an asymmetric increase like this. So if we kind of break that down a little bit more, the top part of that is the image of the background star. So if we're imaging that star, measuring its brightness, this is what it might look like. So as that lens passes in front, it gets brighter and then dimmer again. But then if there's a planet there or a secondary object, then it will show a spike in the magnification as well. So we get this here, so that sharp vertical spike there in our case here could be related to a planet. And then the lens star would give you the broader increase in the magnification or the brightness of that star. So here's an animation to show how that might look. So the top image shows the actual star being measured. And you can see it increase in brightness. And this is obviously a multiple lens object. And then it dims back down again. And the actual the bottom plot is the brightness against time. So you can measure that star over a number of days and you would get this typical shape here if there was another star passing in front in our line of sight. So some examples then of how this can be used to detect planets. Now this one here is a planet that's about five times the mass of Earth and the zoomed in section to the right is due to the planet. So you've got a planetary deviation there from the actual the stellar lens or the star lens that's passed in front of that background star and from the amount that it's actually caused a change in the brightness you can work out the mass of that planet and then this one here 
was a Earth mass free floating planet. So this actually was not orbiting a star. It was just a planet floating around on its own. So it's not part of a star or if it was the star didn't transit or didn't pass in front and it altered the magnification of the star sufficient enough to be detected and it was worked out to be about one times the mass of the earth really so we've got a mass an earth mass size object or just floating around in space on its own it's a free floating planet now some advantages to this particular technique is that it's the only method really that can detect exoplanets in another galaxy. So normally, the stars have got to be reasonably nearby so we can measure their light curve or their radial velocity or other methods to detect an exoplanet because it's a fairly tricky method in the sense that we need very good sensitivity. Now, this method can be used in other galaxies. So we can look at a star in another galaxy, measure it, and it's sensitive enough to detect planets so it's very good for detecting planets a long way. It's like the, for finding those most distant planets. Um, it's also sensitive enough to detect Earth mass planets. So it's one of the methods that's actually quite good for detecting planets the size of the Earth. And also it can detect free floating planets or rogue planets. So these are planets that have been ejected from their system. So during the formation process, planets can get ejected as they interact and scatter each other. We suspect it's happened in our system at some point. And then you have these free floating planets. So it's a it's a good method for detecting those because they're not orbiting a star. So some of the other methods are not viable. So it's a good method for free floating planets. Disadvantages, though, is it takes a lot of telescope time to get one of these detections because it's a chance alignment chances are it's only going to be one single event it won't be repeatable so unlike a transit you might get multiple transits and then you fold them and you get a much better signal with this this method you typically are only going to get one because it's if it's a free floating planet it just happened to pass in front of the star that's it you can't just dedicate so much telescope time for looking at a star as it might not happen so it takes a lot of time in order to get these but there are some advantages as for the method so thank you for watching and if you enjoy you can check out some of the other videos